Welcome everyone to this Ludgate lecture named after Ludgate Circus, home of Bright Blue. For anyone who doesn't know us, Bright Blue is an independent think tank and pressure group for liberal conservatism. The Ludgate lecture is an invitation for prominent thinkers and decision makers to talk about the biggest issues of our time. We are delighted that our lecturer today is the global economist and author, Dr. Dambisa Moyo, who was master of ceremonies at last week's Green Global Investment Summit, and so can talk to us with insight and authority about the needs and responsibilities of business and its role in the fate of our planet. Dr. Moyo wrote in the Financial Times last week about a wall of money waiting to invest in stocks in environmental, social, and governance heavy businesses but she has a concern about a rush to buy without the usual investment rigor and discipline. Dr. Moyer will be at COP, so she can also talk about how good intentions translate into action and when they don't. There has been some corporate irritation about the unwieldy nature of COP. So let's hear from Dr. Moyer about what makes a good company. She will make some introductory remarks. I'll ask a few questions and we'll then take questions from the audience through silo and the code is hashtag Ludgate Lectures. We will be live tweeting the event using the hashtag Bright Blue. Dr. Moyo, welcome, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Sarah. I'm delighted to be here, and thank you so much for this a real prime position and real uh, amazing opportunity to participate in an important conversation at this very important time. Um, what I thought I would do first, because um, you know, in many ways, my title as a global economist might be um, slightly confusing in why it is I'm talking about corporate boards um, and governance, and of course, the role of corporations in particular um, with respect to climate change, but also more generally um, in their societal, broader societal role. So what I thought I might do is just um, reintroduce myself um, by giving a little bit of uh, color as to why it is I feel that I have something to say um, about this important role of corporations in the 21st century. Um, I have um, spent actually a bulk of my career um, in the private sector, um, serving as, a, as, as an executive at, at Goldman Sachs, but also worked in the public sector at the World Bank. Um, but perhaps most uh, recently and most pertinent for today's discussion, I've spent over 10 years, in fact, about 12 years now, um, serving on the boards of a number of large global corporations um, and and I, you know just to illustrate um, they have been you know not just in the UK where I am today but also in the US and continental Europe and Canada um, I've served on um, boards in a multitude of uh, sectors from banking to consumer goods to energy um, and media um, and I've also had the privilege of serving on boards really through um, a decade of a, a whole host of challenging times. I've been on boards where unfortunately we had a, a chairman die in office. We've had, I've been on a board where we've had activists in the stock. Um, I've been on boards where we've had enormous um, mergers and acquisitions. In fact, I was the chairman of the risk committee when SAB Miller in 2016's largest M&A transaction uh, was acquired by, uh, by Anheuser-Busch, ABI. Um, but I've also been on boards where we've had massive restructuring, enormous fines, um, and really a, a whole host of a change um, from uh, what, you know, what, what Milton Friedman for shorthand would call um, the business of business being business uh, into a world where um, right now there's much more pressure um, for corporations to widen their uh, their uh, sort of aperture um, and, and um, widen the uh, utility function. So it's not just about financial shareholders primacy, but also about stakeholders uh, writ large. Um, what I'd like to do today is really draw on a lot of the materials that are in my uh, most recent book, which came out in May, entitled very cryptically, How Boards Work. Um, and um, you know, out of that, to perhaps um, take out a few themes to really um, underscore uh, first and foremost, the, the important role that corporations play in these very large challenges that the global economy um, is facing and will continue to face. Um, but then um, ultimately perhaps um, really move more specifically into the era and into the area, excuse me, of, uh, of climate to talk to you uh, about where I see synergies or opportunities for government um, and corporations to partner with civil society to, towards um, this, uh, solving this very, very uh, enormous challenge. 
So let me take a step back in terms of the book. Why did I write this book? Why write a book about corporate governance and corporate boards um, in the middle of a pandemic um, in this, at this moment in time? And um, I, I, there were essentially two reasons. Um, one is I did feel that it was important to reassert the important role of corporations. Um, I feel that really for, for a good um, 20 years, certainly since the battle in Seattle in 1999, um, Sarah, I think you and I might be old enough to remember, but uh, you know, at that time, a massive demonstration against globalization in Seattle. And I think in many ways that might have been quite a stark mark um, for the, the, the sort of anti-growth, anti-capitalism and anti-corporation uh, sentiment, which has, I would argue, dominated um, the, the sort of better part of the last two decades. So I did feel that through this book, I would reassert that important role of corporations. Why are they relevant? Um, well, they're relevant because they can help in creating jobs. In fact, I was uh, just yesterday at uh, Cliveden and uh, someone I sat next to me said, governments don't create jobs. Jobs are created by the private sector. And it's a sentiment that I feel very sympathetic to. Um, just to give you some, some numbers, in the United States, the top uh, Fortune 500 companies employ 30 million people. Um, Walmart, um, after the US um, government and after the Chinese government is the largest employer in the world. Um, so third largest employer. So really there's a big role to play in terms of job creation. Um, a second key piece of the role of corporations, uh, I believe is in um, providing a tax base. Governments do need to fund public goods like education and healthcare and infrastructure and national security. Um, and in order to do that, they need to be able to rely on a tax base that's not just from individual households, but also from the private sector. And again, if I may just point to um, the United States in this study of the Fortune 500, um, their revenues uh, represent two thirds of US GDP. So just think about that. 66% so of US GDP is represented in the revenues that come from corporations. And in the book, I talk more specifically about what that tax number looks like, but it's not dissimilar in places like the UK and other developed markets. But the third important role that corporations play is really innovation. Um, you know, it, there's no doubt about it that you know, the biggest sort of waves of innovation that we've seen the, the development of Silicon Valley um, and uh, you know, perhaps more recently, uh, the, the development of the vaccine have been in partnership with government. But you know, if you speak to um, Dame Kate Bingham or you speak to people who are, um, who've been really at the coal face of, uh, or even Dame Emma Wamsley, a CEO of GSK, really at the coal face of delivering a vaccine in such a short period of time, not just in terms of the science, but making it scalable and being able to deliver it logistically, I mean, that is something that required both government and the private sector. So again, why this is really just to, again, reassert this important role that corporations play. Um, the second reason I wrote this book is really because it was sort of shocking to me, really, um, having had the opportunity, opportunity to, to uh, teach seminars at top business schools, um, to find that a lot of people just don't understand what boards do. Um, they didn't understand what the mandate of the board is. Um, they've heard about boards. I mean, very often the stories are not very good, I must confess. Um, you know, they think people are playing golf all day or drinking expensive wines, a Chateau de Rothschild or something. But I mean, the truth is um, there are real challenges, not just about the mandate of the board, which I'll come back to in a moment, but also what levers boards actually have um, to effect change. And this is really important because there, that mandate um, I would argue has changed considerably. Um, the, the oldest board that I found in my research dates back to the 1600s. Um, I have been on a corporate a co a company board, Barclays, that's over 330 years old, um, incredibly old. And thinking about moving through uh, World War I and World War II, the Industrial Revolution, um, through different pandemics and um, economic shocks and cycles. Um, but obviously, Barclays has managed to weather that storm over multiple centuries. And I think that the mandate uh, of the board in that respect is really important. Traditionally, there were really two things that boards are supposed to do. One is to mandate to, to oversee the strategy of the company through not just tactical short-term 
uh, gyrations, but through also long-term uh, changes, which we'll talk about later, I'm sure, things like digitization, climate, et cetera. Um, but also they were supposed to hire and fire the CEO um, when need be. And I have actually, um, over my tenure as a board member, um, had the, the experience um, of, of what it is to hire um, a CEO and, and in some instances having to part ways um, because things aren't working out. Um, and I can talk to you a little bit more a little bit later about where I think there's scope to improve um, in the whole process of both strategy and succession. But that's really where things were for centuries. And then really in the, since the business roundtable statement in 2019, we've now seen that corporations have a third mandate, which is to oversee ESG, environment, social and governance. And um, that, you know, on paper sounds, you know, almost sort of how could it take us so long to do that? But as a practical matter, there are enormous challenges that emerge from that. And, and hopefully there'll be an opportunity to discuss some of the trade-offs that corporations are having to make. Um, you know, and I, I would be delighted to give you some examples of what makes it so difficult, um, perhaps in a, in a few minutes. But let me, let me maybe conclude by saying um, the, a few words on climate specifically. And I think it's an interesting one because it is an example of where these trade-offs emerge. Um, and to do that, maybe I'll start by giving you a, a bit of a, a, a few numbers. Um, so today, globally, about 8 billion people were consuming up 100 million barrels of oil every day, 100 million, which is, I think, and when I first heard this, I was astonished that was that much. But we are, 100 million barrels of oil consumed every day for about 8 billion people. Um, we are also um, producing over 50 billion tons of, of emissions, um, greenhouse gases, CO2, et cetera. And uh, you know, one of the things that is you know, quite uh, distressing is that even though we were, have been at home, uh, the, you know, the, essentially the global economy, commerce and trade was shut down for over a year um, through quarantines and those emissions were still rising. Um, and so real concern there about what, what exactly is going on and where we seem to be running out of time and, and it, you know, no surprises that the UN Secretary General has said uh, humanity's on code red. Um, a couple of other statistics, um, you know, yes, it's true that we are dependent on, on, on oil. Um, we are dependent on fossil fuels and carbon-based um, energy to, to the tune of 80% of, of the energy stack today. Um, according to the International Energy Agency, we would need to go down to about 20% in order to hit the scenario of the net zero scenario in 2050. Lots of complications around that. And we cannot lose sight of the fact that there are over 1 billion people, 15% of the world's population uh, in the world today who've got no access to energy uh, in a sustainable, clean, cost-effective way. So we have to be thoughtful. We're not just gonna switch from where we are today to some equilibrium of the future, that's going to take smarts, it's gonna take hard work, and it's definitely gonna take um, all of us at the table, government, private sector, as well as civil society. Um, you know, there's lots more, I can say lots of other examples of the challenges that corporations are dealing with from short-termism um, to uh, you know, changing institutional uh, power of investors, um, concerns around digitization and what that might mean for job creation, deglobalization, and and I, I just I'm listing this um, really hopefully as a prompt to you, Sarah, and, and others on the call um, to just illustrate how much good judgment is going to be required in order for us to navigate this whole slew of challenges. Um, but why don't I why don't I stop here? Uh, I could continue if there are no questions, but maybe it's a good place to stop and and just get a, a, a sort of a gauge of the temperature and pass it back to you, Sarah. Thank you very much indeed. And you, you really laid out the sort of scale of the challenge there. And, and also this very interesting changing role of, of business and expectations. And that it, it's, it's up to you as a, as a board member to somehow, I don't know whether it's sort of broker this new world, um, but to certainly uh, to ask something different of, of business. And, and actually when you laid out, you know, what is business for? Jobs, it's for tax, but now it's for something else. It's for a, a social purpose. And I think, it was the FT that said that decarbonisation will, will require a wartime level of mobilisation. So I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about the role of, the, of money and markets in that, because 
Um, governments are, are meeting at COP to see if they can agree change. We've got a sort of grassroots movement um, towards change. But the role of business um, is, 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 is maybe is what changes things. Yes, absolutely. Um, and I'm glad you asked that question because one of my great concerns right now is too much of the conversation around climate action is um, focused on risk mitigation. So downside scenarios, uh, you know, things like water scarcity, uh, controlling emissions. And please let me be very clear because I know people like to take stuff out of context. I am not saying that those things are not important or critical, they absolutely are. But we cannot shrink to growth. Um, and we do need to take into consideration that if we don't manage this process in a sensible, thought out, well thought out way, we could have disorderly migration, we can have dislocation in markets. I and mean, we have just seen that, the, you know, in terms of the price response to shortages, for example, supply price is, um, uh, response is much higher, the oil price shoots up, um, demand is much more sticky. So people, demand for energy hasn't shifted that much. Um, there's worries about heating, there's worries about access for um, to provide education and, and healthcare to people around the world. So my concern around the narrative of where corporations can actually play a role is first of all, not just focusing on risk mitigation to the downside, but not losing sight of where it is we should be investing um, so that we don't just generate returns, financial returns. We wanna do that as well. Otherwise we're not really going to keep these businesses afloat with serious consequences for employment, et cetera. But we also want to make sure that we're generating returns that add value to society so that we are making progress on climate. What does that look like? It means investing not just in solar and wind and geothermal and biofuels, battery and nuclear gen 4, the whole stack of changes and trials that we're making in these different areas. But it also um, means that we do have to make concerted efforts to try and make the stack that we have, the energy, um, the energy that we rely on today, carbon-based energy better through carbon capture, cap carbon sequestration. And, and I think sometimes in the narrative and the heresy of the, of the conversation, given it's so urgent, it's so large and it's uh, the scale and, and the speed of which things are changing is so enormous. Uh, I worry that that mess is a message that can very quickly get drowned out. Um, and secondly, corporations are the ones who love to, to really go in and think about um, not just R, which is in the research side, but also D. Um, we do need to encourage and create business environments for business that to allocate capital and in essentially reflect and show its genius in allocating capital, which is really part of the job of, of the board's oversight, is making sure and we're allocating capital in a way that, as I said, generates financial returns, but also societal returns. So we can deliver scalable at cost um, energies and really materially put a dent into the climate. Um, perhaps I just add one more uh, important reason that we want uh, corporations involved. And this is because there are these knock-on effects. Um, I mentioned some of them like disorderly migration, you know, more fissures, and we see some of them already. I mean, I'm, I'm not uh, part of the, the government um, the hosting team for COP26, but we've already heard that there are a number of emerging markets as well as developed economies like Australia who are deciding not to come or they're putting pressure on the UN to, to rethink um, their aggressive stance towards um, carbon or you know coal based and other uh, um, other energy forms. And I think that again is a place where business can really step in and, and help be a partner to government um, to think about the, you know innovation, but also risk management in that sort of scope one, two, and three type of, of lexicon, which is what we're doing. And is it realistic to think that business and government, can work together. We we um, we've we've uh, had a um, couple of sort of insults from the government towards business that they that they um, were rather offended by. If I think first of all, well, there was um, the Boris Johnson uh, uh, reported expletive uh, business, and then there was the sense that was business mo you know was business in the end um, just self too self interested that it was going to be um, always in his. In, in that word, moaning, um, or is there a sort of, nat I mean, you use the vaccine as an example where it, the, the two really did work, but on, on that sort of private public partnership, 
when you apply that to climate? Are there are there obvious things that um, where they uh, where they can come together and, and and be a strength rather than work independently? Absolutely. It's not it's not to my mind it's not just a uh, sort of wishful thinking. I think we have explicit examples of where it's worked. Silicon Valley to me is a classic of how this is. And I urge people, if you haven't already, read Margaret O'Mara's book called The Code or go and watch the documentary. It's called Silicon Valley. I mean, it, that was absolutely um, the brainchild of the US government deciding to partner with Bell Labs, a private company and saying, you know what, let's try and put something together that will focus on innovation. I mean, the total value and contribution to society um, is, is untold um, in terms of jobs, in terms of market value, in terms of transformation Forming many people's lives in education and healthcare and business, et cetera. Um, and so that's a specific example. We have other examples, World Wide Web. Um, that was really, again, coming from not just Sir, um, Sir, um, Sir Tim Berners-Lee um, ingenuity there, but also government you know, adopting and taking these um, projects at really nascent stages, helping to figure out how to scale. Um, you've mentioned the vaccine. I mean, there's so many examples in not just far history, but recent history on how government is an essential part of, uh, of, of the, um, the, the business environment and how businesses actually allocate capital and they run these operations so that they're, they are going concerned and can survive come hell or high water over many centuries. So I, I'm not only um, sort of a, a believer in this, uh, uh, this partnership, the idea of partnership, I, I, I would go um, you know, further to say it's absolutely essential um, to get that right in order to, to see the kinds of change at the speed that we want in climate and in other areas. And, and what were your um, uh, reflections on the summit last week of, of what business does want from, from, the, from the government and, and where investment makes sense? Yes. So, you know, first, I was delighted to, to support the summit as the master of ceremony. Um, it was for those people who aren't aware, global, it was telegraphed as a global investment summit. And so we were very keen to really uh, provide a forum for business leaders. And by that, I mean, not just CEOs, but also investors um, and company heads to come to uh, to the table and talk about where they were seeing uh, challenges in trying to you know, put money that's already earmarked um, towards ESG and environment specifically to work. Um, we're talking about $50 trillion, according to JP Morgan. I mean, that is an enormous amount of money. It's bigger than the, all the GDP of the United States um, that is now earmarked towards ESG and the bulk of it towards climate. Um, and so some of the things that people were looking for, they want more um, support and transparency around um, what I call the risk guarantee, the equity piece of so government steps in and says, you know what, um, you know, and, and by the way, I should say off the bat, government has already done this in certain places in the UK in the offshore wind, the UK government, you know, took a flyer here, you know, in, in some of these areas, they take a piece and say, we know this is risky, um, and we're going to help uh, by providing initial capital and we want business to come on top um, as we move from research and development into manufacturing. What other things with business businesses looking for? They want more skills. Um, and that is an area that government traditionally has had um, a greater purview, a bigger role you know, in education. And again, I think it's no accident um, that the countries that, that actually had the vaccine, uh, the UK, the US and uh, Germany in particular, are countries that really um, have emphasized education um, and continue to have universities and scholarship that ranks among the highest in the world. And so that was a second piece um, that was, uh, was, was raised. I mean, a third piece, um, which I would say to a less degree is really obviously getting a sense of the tax environment uh, and incentives in areas where, uh, you know, there might not be immediate returns. How do we think about risk uh, sort of uh, calculations to make sure that companies are not being reckless. And that was certainly a third piece and that I think is really important. But those are specific areas that government can absolutely come in and make a huge difference. And I, I suppose you also see when when you see what business wants to back or where the investment's going, how the markets are behaving, it also shows you what the, the, the sometimes the government may um, indulge in a sort of wishful thinking of what they want. You know, they want UK to be a science superpower and so on. But business is the um, is a kind of truth of saying, well, this an is arbiter. What they're, what they're the sense of arbiter. Yeah, exactly. So, um, was there any sign in terms of where we should go for our energy policy and the future of our economy? Did did, did you have a sort of sense of that um, by seeing what what business was interested in? 
Yes, you know, I think it was um, very telling to have people like Bill Gates in the room. I mean, he is a very much an innovator, very much somebody who's got a track record of, of innovation and science. Um, and he had a conversation with the prime minister, talked specifically about things that he think would be useful and interesting. I mean, one of the things I took away from his specific comments um, are that, you know, we should have the temerity to understand that not everything is going to win. Um, you know, and I, I went through that list of the, the sort of stack of energy uh, innovations, not just to, to show, uh, you know, uh, knowledge, but really to say, listen, if we knew out of 8 billion people how to create cost effective, sustainable and clean energy, out of 8 billion of us, if one person knew, we would know the answer. We believe in creative destruction. We want people out there coming up with this. If we don't have the answer, it means that it's very difficult. And I think having Bill Gates there as an example to say, this is what I'm struggling with. And he specifically said he's very uh, challenged with the R. He thinks a lot of businesses need to be incentivized to come into research um, and to take those flyers and in some instances to lose. But we also had finance people in the room um, who were very interested in stress testing um, and how they manage their balance sheets. We had Larry Fink from BlackRock. We had Jimmy Diamond from uh, from JP Morgan, um, you know, uh, Jess Stady from Barclays, sorry, Steve Schwartzman from BlackRock, uh, Blackstone, excuse me. I mean, real um, stalwarts of the financial industry with you know enormous checkbooks. I think the prime minister said there was something like $25 trillion of, of capital represented in the room. They were there to, to put money to work. And so um, they were also very, very, uh, I think, clear in terms of where they can add value, again, with this investment in, in sight, not just risk mitigation on the downside. Is there also a role for business in global terms that, that some of the decisions that governments have to make are, are to do with um, Political, political possibility, whereas corporations have a different view and that um, since we are going to have to have some global solutions for this in the same way we did with the pandemic, isn't it advantage, is there an advantage for, for business in, in dealing with some of these issues that they, that they can cross borders more easily perhaps? Yes, absolutely. And I'm glad you said that because I think too often um, the conversation, aside from just being about risk mitigation and not investment, I worry a lot this, uh, as somebody who was born and raised in Africa and specifically in one of the poorest countries in the world, um, I worry that there's just a little bit too much um, a sort of uh, sort of sweeping over the fact that the, the, the manner in which we might address climate action in the West is wholly um, unacceptable in, in, in many countries around the emerging markets where they have you know, billions of people who are living extremely impoverished lives. They are e trying to eke out a living. You know, 90% of the world's population lives in the emerging markets. We have to come up with a solution that um, allows their improvements in their living standards and gives them access to education and healthcare and doesn't prejudice, this climate agenda should not prejudice their living experience. Um, you know, and, and I'm not at all um, trying to, to belittle or dismiss the urgency and the scale of the climate problem, um, but to my mind, something as large as this is a global public good or a negative externality problem of the scale and size in which we're facing requires all hands on deck. Uh, it requires people from all over the world to come so that we can thread the needle of the solutions. We can't just be sitting in a, in a room navel gazing and saying, well, you know, I'm in the West and therefore I think the solution is X, you know, cut back supplies when actually people are, are really struggling um, to, uh, to eke out a living. And so in that respect, I do think government has to be at the table. Um, I think, and I, I think private sector can help by saying, well, I'll tell you what, I'm, I'm in operating in 20 company, uh, countries and um, the attitude by the regulator in place X is quite different from place Y. And, um, and you know, even between the, US, the Europe and, and the US, in the Europe, they're very rules-based. Um, the US tends to be much more principles-based. I mean, that's in the same Western advanced economy. There's so many differences. And I think businesses can bring the nuance of those um, uh, of those uh, geopolitical considerations to, to the, the table as well. That's very interesting. And, and one thing that you, you've talked about is finding a sort of mechanism perhaps that, um, uh, that, that could distribute um, some of this better. And, and carbon pricing is, is one, whether you create a global market. Um, are you, could you explain to me a bit your, your views on 
carbon pricing? Yeah, so I think people who know me know that I'm really keen on transparency. I don't like opacity and sort of things that are, are hard um, to, to price. Um, and I think that's where the markets have a, an important role. Um, carbon pricing, uh, I do think there's a lot more scope um, for better mechanisms, better agreements around how to think about climate pricing. But I, I'm also not so naive as to not understand that this could create a lot of problems. The IEA report from a couple of months ago um, actually talks about the range of pricing right now uh, per ton for CO2 is somewhere between $10 and $60. And they estimate that if you actually did price the carbon, it could be as high as $200 um, a ton. So you can see how, and, you know, ascribing these costs in principle, um, and for somebody like myself in particular who likes markets, um, would say this is actually exactly where we should be heading. But again, we cannot be hasty in a dealing with these issues. We, we might be all wanting to move towards a low carbon future. And by the way, all the rooms, policy, endowment, investors, boards, everybody is subscribed to a low carbon future. But understanding how we get there is really an important aspect that needs to be addressed. And so I'm very much a, a supporter of more transparency. I think the financial markets can help in terms of carbon pricing and governments can certainly lead on this, but I'm also very, very conscious um, that we wanna do it in a way that doesn't leave people, uh, again, uh, sort of prejudiced because they, they are living in countries where they're going from $10 a ton to $200 and that could materially affect business models, companies and, and how we actually access energy as individuals. Thank you and I've, I've uh, got a first question coming in which is about different forms of energy. We've talked about geography and geology and, and, and different circumstances um, but, but do you have a sort of preferred um, mix yourself or are, are you a nuclear girl are you hydrogen <laughs> or, uh, or, 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 or do you sort of pick parts of the world and think um, you could do that and you could do that as well as the pace of choosing what's the right form of energy or, or do you just want to put everything into hydrogen? Or so I think it's a, it's a wonderful question because I, I am very much of the view that it's far too early for us to pick our poison. And this is again, um, why I get very sort of agitated when I hear people say, you know, have an, a, a sort of a subscribe to this doctrine that everything renewable is great, everything fossil fuel is bad um, or, or awful. Um, because I do think that we should be looking, we should throw everything on the wall. If we have to rub two stones together, then so be it. I mean, that should be on the agenda. Um, uh, of course, I'm saying that flippantly again, uh, you know, I, I mean, a social media world that somebody might say, Dambisa Moyo said, rub two Two stones together. Um, but my point is really that um, we should be open minded about where the solution is going to come from because of the scale of, of the problem. Um, I, I, I think I would say that um, looking at um, sort of uh, mano, mano a mano, you know, pound for pound value um, and, and sort of reliability, hydrogen looks very promising to me. Um, I find that really interesting. I think batteries. Um, if we can actually extend life, that would be an area which has got huge upside. And by the way, hydrogen, I think we're talking about moving away from gray into more green and uh, and uh, blue. The cost curves are, are extremely high. Um, a lot of people are working on those, bringing those cost curves down, but they are high. Um, but that's an area I think that is scalability matters. If you want to have affordable, you've got to be able to scale. And uh, that's an opportunity, I think, right there. I mean, some of the other ones like solar and offshore wind, et cetera, have had great hits and many of them are um, in different regions um, and it's quite uh, sort of sustainable um, even without subsidies and that's great news. We're glad to hear that that's um, viable. But uh, you know, even in the UK we've seen, you know, wind is, is can be unreliable. Um, and so things like nuclear gen four, I'm very open-minded about this. And I don't think again, we should a priori start to, to rule out things. We should think about carbon sequestration. We should not be thinking about um, you know, just uh, taking stuff off without uh, due consideration. And, and look, as I said, by 2050, even the, the, the IEA scenario still has 20% of the energy stack. The best case scenario of the, the net zero scenario from the IEA is that we still have 20% of the energy coming from carbon-based uh, energy. So we, we should be making an effort as well in that to, to clean it up. And you've mentioned energy poverty that we, we, we just talk, we've just talked about the, um, the climate challenge, but for um, that part of the world, which um, is 
firstly fairly blameless in all this, but actually also need some form of energy. Do you think um, that there should, if, if one were distributing the carbon budget, should should they be allowed a bit more of sort of fossil fuels than than others, or do you do or do you think that's a chance to leapfrog and um, and go for something more innovative, so that you could have people going at different um, paces? Look, I mean, I think that, um, you know, you, you just touched on the, the fundamental problem. And again, as someone who believes in 80-20 rule, I mean, the biggest emitters are China and the United States. Um, China does have a net zero policy out to 2060. The U.S. doesn't. Um, and, and frankly, I mean, in terms of leadership and really getting, you know, 80 percent of this problem right, I think it'd be, it would be just certainly in terms of emissions. Um, so, again, downside, not necessarily increasing the production of stuff. Uh, I think uh, it would be we'd go far away um, to to get that right. Um, but you know, I, look, I think that if it, it goes back to what I've said already, if we could find something that was cost effective and scalable, um, I do think countries around the world, um, poor countries, would be happy to leapfrog. They leapfrogged the phone telephone lines into mobile phones, so they are desperate for the energy. Um, but you know, we don't want to to um, to push them into a situation of further energy poverty, given a billion plus already are in that situation um, you know, of, of, of energy poverty. And I think that people don't fully understand the real consequences. A lot of talkers out there, but don't, don't fully understand what the consequence of living without energy really means. Um, and, I, and I wish there was a bit more um, sort of maturity around really understanding what, what, what sort of defunding or these types of very aggressive campaigns may mean for, for livelihoods and, and lives around the world. It is, well, it's, it's, I think someone referred to it as the sort of progress track that, um, of course, you're going to think sometimes of your immediate needs, but it may be that then long term, there's the, the penalty and how you, how you do short term and long term, which is something, I guess, that you address in businesses all the time. And is that something you're having to rethink of, of having to think long term rather than short term? Well, I think it's essential. Um, I look at businesses that I've been involved in, and the truth is the ones that su succeed over challenged periods, whether it's a financial crisis, it's Brexit, it's populism, it's a pandemic, are ones that are able to say, yes, you know, there are tactical short-term problems and, you know, that will knock you sideways but you shouldn't lose sight of the long-term strategic or more systematic goals. And I think that that's true for corporations, but it's also true for, for countries. Countries that are, can't just go from pillar to post in terms of addressing uh, crises, because we, we essentially, as someone said to me recently, Dambisa, you're, you're always gonna be surprised. This is a friend of mine who's in his eighties. He said, trust me, you are always going to be surprised. And I think there's something quite powerful in that statement that, you know, if you are going to always be surprised, you need to spend a lot of time having a compass um, and, and really navigating the, the deltas or the changes around that compass as you can continue to go move forward. But you can't just sort of think about constantly um, battling it out um, in the here and now as being a strategy. I think that that's um, where a lot of companies and governments um, fall afoul. They just don't have any strategic planning. They're not thinking about data being data driven or thinking about the future of AI and quantum and investing in infrastructure of the future. And that's just, it's to me a, a sort of surefire way of, uh, of falling behind and, and actually into, into greater challenges in the future. So you can't just firefight. Um, I've got some questions um, coming through. Um, one is how big a, of a problem is greenwashing and how do corporations demonstrate genuine green credentials? That's a, a wonderful question. And really, I think picks up on the article that I wrote last week in the Financial Times. Um, I did mention already that we're talking about $50 trillion of capital that has been earmarked into ESG, the bulk of it going into climate. Um, there's no doubt about it that um, a large amount of money um, can create um, sort of uh, um, dislocations um, and mispricings in the market. And we're seeing that already. If you look at renewable energies at low, pri low pricing of the stack, so early stage companies, um, not even series A, when you see institutional investors come in, are pricing at sort of 15, uh, to 17 times uh, revenues. And that's extremely high. It's a very expensive uh, multiples um, without really showing business acumen or survivability of a business model or even an idea. Um, and in this, at the same time, we've seen traditional energy 
um, markets, uh, you know, oil and gas companies. I, I think I mentioned that I serve on the board of, of one of these uh, large global complex energy companies. Um, but the truth is we've seen that that that, uh, that sector really get hammered quite uh, dramatically. Um, it used to be about 25% of the uh, s p it's now much smaller it's about uh, two to three percent and i think a lot of that is emblematic of money moving out of the uh, of the sector um but can i just to address the question of greenwashing specifically um you know there's no doubt about it that part of what we're seeing is this wall of money going into renewables for example uh is really um and this is the caution that i was making in the article we have to make sure that that's not just demonstration uh, oh, look, I've invested in wind or solar. We, in order for us to really get at what we're trying to do, which is get to a low carbon future and provide sustainable cost effective uh, energies, um, we do need to make sure that the investments are uh, sort of applying uh, business principles that are solid um, and, that, and that can actually ensure viability over the long term. You know, it's hard for me to gauge how widespread um, greenwashing is, so so-called greenwashing. But certainly, if you believe the numbers that I just mentioned, which are market numbers, you can look at them, uh, you know, on Bloomberg or Reuters or wherever. Um, it, it's clear that there is a um, an enormous amount of money that I would argue is being driven by demonstration and not by the uh, plausibility or feasibility of, of long-term success. Um, so I am hoping to see many more standards that come into place. I think there will be more standards from the regulators, um, which will, you know, we, we do it for financial audits, for PPE plants and, um, and the equipment. Uh, we do it for uh, worker audits. We're gonna do it now more, you know, more aggressively auditing the financials and operations as well as uh, workers, I think that um, there not that more and more there'll be an expectation that the audit committees uh, on which I tend to serve uh, will be also focused on on auditing the sort of investment in energy uh, and new energies to make sure that there is uh, less and less greenwashing. So I, I'm optimistic that will change quite dramatically. And, and, and you, not only I suppose is the danger of the cynicism that it creates, but you've also talked about the danger of a financial bubble. Um, Absolutely. Um, and do you think that that is a possibility that we hit another financial crisis in the midst of all this? You know, I'm, I'm less worried about the financial crisis in the manner in which it happened last time, because we do have a lot of capital controls on, on the banking balance sheet. So it would be hard to create that sort of systemic risk um, that was problematic in 2008. But I am, you know, like most economists and policymakers and actually most people, a little bit worried and keeping an eye out on inflation. Um, you know, energy prices are up. Um, yes, it's true that it's not a UK phenomenon. This is a global problem. It's partly driven by the fact that we've had an increase in aggregate demand. We were all at home last year. Now we're all back and there's this massive uh, shoot, but also um, it, it, you know, partly to do with the supply chain, supply chain constraints. So there are a, number, a multitude of things that um, could be problematic in terms of inflation. And, and, and as you pointed out, the stimulus money, the low interest rate environment is um, allowing people to take money uh, and put it into renewables at, at perhaps, uh, you know, with less rigor and less uh, sort of a, of a keen business eye than, than they might otherwise if, uh, if they weren't just motivated by, by optics. And, and so that's, I think it's something we have to keep an eye out for. Okay, another question, thank you. Uh, what is one example of a global solution to the climate crisis? that's a good balance of risk mitigation and growth innovation? Um, I would say one of the things that I found interesting is General Electric, which um, many of you will know was started by Thomas Edison, the scientist over a hundred years ago. Um, they are looking and they're, I think they might be the one of, if not the only one, one of the only corporations that I have heard of that has gone out and actually made scope, not just scope one and two proclamations around their emissions, but also scope three. And to my mind, um, that is an example of a business that understands the risk profile. So scope one, two, and three is really about emissions and trying to curb the emissions, um, but they're calculating those emissions um, as well as overlaying that with real investments. And for example, they had representatives at the Global Investment Summit. Specifically, that's a business that knows that they have to put money to work in order to keep their business running. So for me, uh, you should, I would really urge whoever asked the question, have a look at what GE is doing. Cause I think that that's a live example um, you know, that where I've been really impressed, like, oh, okay, hang on. So there are businesses who are not just rushing around with metrics and saying, here, we're doing the right thing. 
um, operationally and financially, where you know how we, we we issue debt into the markets now. Green bonds, we've got operational changes, which are all important. But they're going a step further and saying we've got scope one, two, and three um, emission targets as well as uh, as investing. So I, I think they're a great model, um, and I, I've been very impressed by by some of the things that they're doing. Thank you. And another one: What are your hopes, fears, and predictions for COP twenty six? Um. Hopes, I hope um, both developed and developing countries are adequately represented. Um, fears um, that you won't have <laughs> uh, both developed and developing countries uh, adequately represented. So I, I worry that we could come out with a statement that is very suited for Western countries, developed econ economically developed countries, but doesn't really fly in emerging markets. So that balance is not adequately reflected. Um, my prediction is that it will probably be um, uh, probably somewhere in the middle, partly because there are pledges out there, such as the 100 billion. Um, some of you will know from COP16, uh, 100 billion, which is supposed to go to the emerging markets, it has not yet been met. Um, you know, was, since that last meeting, something big has happened. We've had a pandemic. Um, and so, again, we need to see the maturity of understanding that um, there, you know, what's the urgent versus the important. Again, this is not to denigrate climate, but people are dying. There, you know, many places around the world, my, uh, my continent of origin, Africa, but also South America and Asia have less than 1% uh, uh, you know, um, vaccination rates. Uh, at, you know, and this is really damaging, not just for those countries, but for global commerce, for travel. I mean, it's going to actually hit all of us for these global public goods. So my prediction is that there will be sense, good sense will prevail. I hope, it might be a hope more than a prediction, um, but uh, I, I think that it's in everyone's interest um, to realize that this is very complex. Um, I should maybe just say one last hope, which is also that um, we, don't, we, we don't encourage or um, pursue these sort of fractured discussions where, you know, last week we had a global investment summit talking about green, but they shouldn't be in the policy discussion or here we're going to have a global summit on uh, from the, from the uh, NGOs about green, but th these people are talking you know, in parallel and not really in the same room. So I, my hope is really not just developed and developing, but also these different sectors can come together. Everybody has some value. Um, and, you know, as I, I, sit, I sit on a board where it, they really are at the tip of the spear. They understand how you put a carbon, a hydrogen and oxygen together um, at certain pressures to create energy that's enabling me to zoom onto this call today. I want to know what the limits um, of our abilities are from these other areas. And we're not gonna do that if we're having these separate conversations in siloed rooms. So that's that's what I would say. Very point about it being the need for it to be joined up. Um, uh, one more from uh, Margaret. Is there any need for compensations for, for companies that ended up with stranded assets from the transition away from fossil fuels? It's a great question. I was just reading something today actually um, about uh, st uh, some, uh, a proposal in Asia around stranded assets. Um, you know, I think it's not, it's something that hasn't really been explored in a fulsome manner. We have had bad banks, as they called them before, um, when we had the financial crisis. Um, I would really love to see somebody do some smart work on this, because I think that um, this is one of the problems. We can't just switch off these things and walk away. I mean, there are um, sort of uh, uh, trailing costs that need to be thought about. So I think that's a brilliant question. I don't have a specific answer. I, I you know, there was, um, and you know, people wanted. I can send it to you, Sarah, if people you know, want to distribute it. But there was, there is one particular um, bad bank kind of model. Uh, stranded assets type of model. And I know McKinsey actually, you know, you and I know uh, Sarah from a conversation that we were a, a party to um, that McKinsey's is also looking at some of this, but I, I, I'm astonished that there hasn't been more work done on it, but I think it would be something interesting, but especially for, for coal, um, uh, coal assets. Um, and thank you for that. And uh, so I suppose in the last five minutes or so, just just on the, the, the broader, um, well, actually, this has been a pretty broad theme, perhaps more specific theme of companies and boards and responsibilities. And um, and if you could talk a little bit more about that, um, the role of a, of, a, of a board member. And um, so, as you say, that the mandate has changed, that, you're, that the expectations of, of companies have changed, but you still believe that um, companies are a force for good. The business is a force for good, and and if you could tell me the, the you know the, 
what you've discovered that makes you optimistic from being on the many boards that you've served on and, and the lessons that you've learned? So um, I have no doubt about it. You know, I, I mentioned, I alluded a moment ago, I was born and raised in Africa. Um, and, you know, one of the challenges of growing up in a poor economy is that there is um, really, you know, to your point, joined up thinking by the government, by the private sector, there's really slow job creation. A lot of the conversations we have here, even though they're sort of characterized by, uh, you know, sort of a lot of uh, uh, conflict, you would argue. Um, I, I think that that it's missing in these countries, and a lot of it is because there's nobody there to allocate capital in a smart way. Um, who thinks about innovation? Who thinks about um, you know long-term considerations such as taxes, such as incentives, such as education, etc. So, to my mind, I mean, I, growing up there and now having had the the, the benefit of and privilege of traveling around, I think that's a big miss to not have corporate uh, corporations. Uh, think about how to uh, to allocate resources and continue to help to drive growth in a sort of sustainable way. And I think that's the point, really, that you know, growth has gotten a bad name. Um, and I'm and I'm not here to say corporations are are flawless. Um, they we've had lots of bad bad corporations, bad actions, bad actors. Um, and and I think that uh, regulation and government should. And I'm not a big bureaucrat. You know, I'm, I'm much more um, you know small government model type of person but you know i think an efficient government can actually make sure corporations are are working um, as the best partners that they can be um you know i i am um in terms of my own experience from these different boards what have i learned um you know you know suspend your uh ideological views um you know trying to turn a tanker that's a th over 300 in years old that has had and has operated under certain you know, parameters. It's been, you know, a, let's say a bank or a, a consumer goods company that has operated in a world where, uh, you know, globalization works and you can trade over borders and capital moves over borders. Um, and then realizing actually, hang on, we're now moving into a world where that's not going to happen. And you're now in a more uh, sort of uh, West versus rest type of an environment, more siloed, um, less immigration, less trade flows, less capital, less global cooperation, et cetera. I mean, those types of shifts, tectonic shifts structurally mean that you can't come to the boardroom with, you know, pounding on the table saying this is the way the world is. Um, and, you know, without, without really being sensible and using good judgment. Um, you know, when people, I was just talking to a chairman this morning of a very large corporation that we all know, and uh, he said to me, he said, you know, Demi, we're under so much pressure to just shut down in certain countries. Um, but when we signed up for these 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 uh, organizations to to invest in these countries, the government was actually tickety poo, great, wonderful. You know, they've ticked all these buttons or uh, all these boxes. And then years pass by, and it's it's uh, you know taken over by a despot. And people say, oh, we want you to leave the country. He says they want us to leave our employees, our customers. They want us to leave our infrastructure. We can't. That's not how smart business, but also smart leaders should think. We should be thinking about diplomacy. We should be thinking about things in transitions, not in jumping from one to another, because there are these cons considerable. Uh, second order or knock-on effects. So how do I show up, and how do I think people should show up? Use your good judgment, um, and and for sure, don't be so ideological that you shut out the fact that we are living in an interesting world. Uh, it's hard to say that what China has done is uh, is wrong or bad. They've moved hundreds of millions of people out of poverty in decades. There's something for us to learn from that. It's a deprioritized democracy society. They use state capitalism. What is it that they're getting getting right that we're not? And so, um, you know, I'm belaboring the point, but I think. For me, when I interview new board candidates, I'm looking for good judgment, not the right answer, just framing things, understanding that there are always gonna be tensions, uh, even for things that may seem sort of obvious, like discrimination. We all abhor it, but we also understand that from the boardroom, we don't want to send the signal um, to fight discrimination with discrimination. Uh, that's not good for people who look like me 
um, because people will, will assume that actually you're only there because you're black or a woman or et cetera. Um, but it's also not good for competition for the business because we don't want to lose high performing white guys or majority uh, population. So we have to be sensible um, as we think about these. And maybe I'll just leave you with one last point, which is something that President Obama said. It's in my book because uh, I liked it so much. But he said when he was president, he realized that by the time something was in his inbox, it meant it was really difficult. If it were easy, somebody else would solve it. And I think that's true for business leaders, people on boards but also public policymakers and people who want to be leaders, the problems you're going to deal with are not obvious. If they were obvious, somebody else would deal with it. You wouldn't have to worry about it. But by the time it gets to you, whether it's climate change, inequality, digitization, growth, technology, and the risk of a you know, jobless underclass, debt, you know, the list is endless. You've got to take a view that this is very complex and there are, if we don't do good judgment, um, real considerable costs uh, associated with it. Good judgment is a very, um, very good way to end because uh, I guess that is exactly what we're looking for now in the world. But also, if we had more time, it would be um, interesting to talk about that relationship with China and, and when you engage and when you don't. And again, that different business perspective. And I guess also just how resilient you think our capitalist system is just now. We're talking about really questioning everything we've seen through the pandemic, um, how people have started to, to, to rethink, you know, what they want, their values, their relationships, and and whether we really have the right systems for the questions. Um, perhaps one last thing, just as we're running down the clock on capitalism itself, do you think capitalism needs to respond um, to, to these to these great global shocks? I think they, they I think they must. Um, and, and I am a believer that we all in society should want that businesses and governments and individuals are allocating capital to things that are going to enhance society. Um, and and we you and I can even differ on that. I was talking to somebody the other day, they were pressing me, would you join the board of a gambling company? You know, is that a, is a company that's and and look, I'm not here to pass judgment on what society wants or doesn't want. We're paying 150,000 pounds a week to footballers and 30,000 pounds a year to, to nurses. I mean, society is making those judgment calls. Um, but I do think that capitalism, which by the way, we have not experienced to the nth degree because there are always subsidy programs in, you know, in Europe with common agriculture policy, farm subsidies in the US. So we always are living in a world where government is is in there trying to uh, to, uh, to to manage these um, market uh, collapses or market uh, uh, in, inconsistencies. But I think fundamentally, uh, I want to see the best people making the uh, making the vaccines. I want my, the best pilot, the best doctor uh, to take care of me. Um, and I think that that's what capitalism can bring. Um, again, must be regulated. Uh, we can't just allow, allow crony capitalism or things to go uh, off the rails. Um, so there is a balance that needs to be struck, which is why government has a big role to play. Thank you very much indeed to our Ludgate lecturer. Thank you very much to our audience and thank you to Bright Blue for organizing this. A really frank, fearless and fascinating as, as ever. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you so much. Delighted to be here.